The legend of Sleepy Hollow, can the source material live up to all of the remakes? Let's talk about this story, which could only have been written by a man. Oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you read this. <laughs> Jeez, man, yeah. Well, it's very easy from an ethnocentric perspective sure. to like, judge. Yeah, I gotta take off my rose-colored glasses and not right. be so judgy-judgy. Right, let's let's figure out what the happy mediums today. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am the man, Crypto. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we go heavy into detail on the stories that we read. Today we are doing The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. If you are down for literature discussions like that, please consider hitting the subscribe button. And as always, we start off with publication information. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is a gothic American short story published in 1820 in the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon. Worth noting here that some editions do not contain the postscript by Knickerbocker. A little bit about Washington Irving, the author. He was born in 1783 in Manhattan, New York, and he'll move to Europe as a young man to study law. He will write under the pen name Jeffrey Crayon, and he doesn't gain uh, a lot of recognition as a young man, but eventually he will be recognized as one of the first to gain some notoriety by Europeans as an American writer. Now, let me try and do the plot, and I'm going to do my best not to have this Disney movie influence me, because I've seen some people make some mistakes here <laughs> with, how, <laughs> with how famous these movies are. It's kind of hard to take the story and pretend like you've never seen the movies. Yeah, give it so, to me, Johnny Depp. So the story starts off near New York, near Terrytown, in a small, sleepy village called Sleepy Hollow, which is comprised mostly, apparently, of Dutch inhabitants. <laughs> The town was said to be bewitched, and one of the most popular ghost stories was the Headless Horseman, a beheaded Hessian from the Revolutionary War. A tall, gangly Connecticut man named Ichabod Crane comes to town with his feet like shovels. I love that quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's he an becomes, odd quote, right? I, I, I don't know. It just It's interesting to me. He becomes the schoolmaster, but moves around performing odd jobs for room and board and is poorly paid. He soon sets his eyes on Katerina Van Tassel, a well-to-do <laughs> young woman. However, she's also being courted by the town stud, Brom Bones, and soon Ichabod is believed to have won Katerina's heart now bones starts playing tricks on poor little ichabod now at the harvest festival they get together in a group and have a dance in good time that is until it was time to go home because ichabod failed to seal the deal with katarina before he left he leaves upon his ride gunpowder and is soon haunted by the headless horseman he attempts to flee over a bridge but is struck when the headless horseman launches his head at him <laughs> Not the way to get ahead in life, am I right? <laughs> I actually laughed at that part because I don't know, it seemed funny <laughs> being written down. I, mean, I know in a movie or a show it's supposed to be scary, but it didn't come across that way in the story no. at all. No, it didn't get me either. But back in Sleepy Hollow, the town moves on. Brom Bones shudders whenever he hears about the tale of Ichabod. And I'll say that's mostly the plot, right? Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption, but it's definitely very different than the iterations that we usually see in media today. My favorite is when people say they launched the pumpkin because the question is, did he launch the pumpkin? And I love watching nerds get so mad, like, he threw his head, it wasn't a pumpkin. And it's like, well, was it? <laughs> let's talk about that, right? Yeah. So in terms of autofictional elements, let's get this out of the way. Scholars will point out that Irving really did live in Terrytown, okay? And he actually does did live, which was a small Dutch city. And they'll also point out that he moved to England and became wildly famous while publishing under the pseudonym in England, okay? So he was literally an American living amongst Europeans that some people will point out that the ideas of expansion, the Connecticut man that wants to kind of explore and, and, and take from others in terms of eating and being greedy but being described as gangly and always hungry, they're going to point out that this could be the, the European critique almost of American culture, even though cuts coming from an American is one way that scholars will typically break this down. Another fine point is that he actually was, he was engaged to a young woman named Matilda, who died before they could actually get married. So is this Washington Irving's grief that he's writing out through Ichabod and, and Katerina that never worked out as well? Interesting ways to break down the story. I, I would just point out that we're aware of those interpretations. 
I think it's probably a combination of the two together. It's a little bit of elements of both. I mean, it's very easy to argue one side or the other. So why why can't we have both? So let's start off with the narration, which is hysterical to me, right? We have Washington Irving, who's releasing this book, The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cran, right? So we're first of all, he's under the pseudonym of Jeffrey Cran as he's writing this. <laughs> and the story is allegedly being told by this uh, Diedrich Knickerbocker. <laughs> So we have a pseudonym writing about Diedrich Knickerbocker, who found this story decades later and is now telling us, and in the postscript, if your version doesn't have that, just make sure you know which one the teacher assigned to you, right? But in the postscript, even Diedrich is just like, yeah, I don't know if I totally believe all of this, but here's this tall tale. So what is this narration? This is hysterical to me to begin with. Oh, yeah, this is like some Inception level stuff right here. (laughs) It's so meta, it's crazy. Like, I think that, I think that Irving knew what he was doing, and he was trying to see if anybody would catch on to how ridiculous he's making this. Well, we're, we're taking a walk down exaggeration lane, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what I love about this story, I really do, is we start off almost distancing ourselves from big city Manhattan where he grew up, right? We're not in Manhattan. We're not in Terrytown. We're in this small little sleepy village called Sleepy Hollow, right? So we're, we're removing ourselves further and further away from the society, right? The, the expansion mindset. And everything in the story is almost like can just be taken as true to begin with. Like this town is true. People know towns like this. People know villagers like this. The setup of the school teacher, the setup of the small towns, people helping other people out, all very realistic and true things. And what's interesting is as we go through the story, the fables and the, the, expansion of what I heard slowly start to creep in until you get to the very end where I'm going to point out if these are papers that Diedrich Knickerbocker found, who wrote that chase scene? Because if Ichabod's gone, right, yeah. he probably didn't write it. The Hessen? Did the, headle- did the headless <laughs> horseman write this story? So, so we start off in this very true, very relatable environment. We start hearing how oh, the town's bewitched. You know, lots of normal things happen. And then at this this event gathering, well, we're going to start to tell all these ghost stories where this town kind of believes in these ghost stories. And we're taking a walk down exaggeration further and further towards fairy tale land to ultimately where we ended up in this fairy tale starting off in a very true story. It's very easy to get lost in the magical realism of this story. Irving saying don't believe these things. You cannot trust what you see, in, a, in especially in a ghost story. And I think that also kind of, to the earlier point about the autofictional elements, that speaks to probably a lot of the influence that he was seeing in Europe at the time. Europe is hugely into ghost stories, particularly at Christmas time. Try and find a Victorian ghost story without ghosts in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a quote here about he was a native of Connecticut a state which supplies the Union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest, and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodsmen and country schoolmasters. Okay, where do you think he's going with this one, Crypto? So I think in the story, Irving is trying to maybe see the change of pace for the Americans, where everybody is okay with the European style and life and culture from a day-to-day standpoint. But we see that... Ichabod and others in the story are a little bit restless and there's this change that's taking place in America versus Europe as we go through this journey. Well, it's interesting too because he almost depicts the change is not ideal, right? Ichabod is gangly while everyone else is like almost described as healthy and plump. When Ichabod disappears, they don't reopen the school. They Did they did they burn his books? Am I, am I imagining that? Like there, there seemed to be a lot of anti-Ichabod sentiment after Ichabod disappeared at the end. And it made me kind of think that he's almost, one way to view it is he's almost romanticizing the old European ways. Yeah, and here we see that Ichabod is a Yankee and he comes from a different area than the people, he comes from a different area of the country of Sleepy Hollow where these people are primarily Dutch. And I think that brings back to your point is that Ichabod's supposed to feel like a foreigner even though he's in his own country. There is very different ideals of how to live one's life between the different states at this time. Yeah, I think Ichabod is also kind of representing of, you'll notice that the usage of the church 
and belief in things like religion is clearly something that was important to the Dutch, right? Definitely. The Dutch people leave Europe in order to gain the religious freedom, kind of set up their own churches. And then the Dutch people will live very, very strict lives. They they take the, the Dutch... The Dutch will take the idea of living these very strict lives and living by the commandments and the word of God uh, to the next level. And I think we see that here in the story as well as Ichabod is somebody that might be kind of challenging that with his books and his teachings and his readings because you're not supposed to be questioning the word of God and what he is supposed to be teaching the people. And Ichabod is doing that. All right, let's, let's kind of move into the ending and the belief of these superstitious Dutch villagers and what they believe happened at the end, right? Because I feel like the narration, you know, when he leaves Crestfallen at the end of the night, it leads a lot open to question who is the villain and how did Ichabod really die? What was your take at this point in time? So here I really had a hard time seeing Ichabod as the hero. And I feel like that Ichabod might have been the villain and that Brom Mm. wasn't. And I think that sometimes people are going to do that just because Yes, Brahm is painted more in a negative fashion than Ichabod, and it almost feels like Ichabod's being bullied and that he's being picked on throughout the story and that there's such this negative depiction of him with his physical appearance. But I really feel like Brahm kind of gets shorthanded here and that Irving, while gave him a few negative nuances, he's just kind of a good old boy before there's a good old boy. He did pick, he did mess up. The classroom, he did specifically taunt Ichabod to the ends of him trying to win Katarina. But he's he's gray, right? He's not, a, he's not, this isn't black and white characters. These are actually incredibly gray characters. While Gree, Ichabod, very greedy, very willing to take advantage of others, using Katarina, like surprising, an old, really old white American, writing a, no women into the story, only to be used as means to an end, right? Like, Ichabod yeah. only wanting to marry Katerina for the purpose of having an easy life, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you look at Ichabod, he's a womanizer. So you have an outsider coming in here and trying to take advantage of all of the women. And poor Brahm, I think, is trying to stand up for maybe his sisters, his cousins. This is a very small village. Everybody's probably going to be related. And he sees this guy that's trying to take advantage, and he has the wherewithal to stop Ichabod. I think Brahm kind of gets the the short end of the stick here in that regard that he's not the villain. Well... Who killed Ichabod? Did Ichabod die? I think Ichabod did die. And for me, I think that he was riding his horse. He had a panic attack. He hit a branch. It knocked him in the head. And he fell off, broke his neck, and died. Let me let me give you another interpretation here that I had. So, Brom brags about how good of a writer he is. He brags and even depicts the story of where to go when the horseman's chasing you. So he said, don't go down this way. I have a friend that escaped the headless horseman by heading that way. And then you'll notice when Ichabod is trying to run away from this very agile and skilled and adept rider starts to head the way Brom recommended that he ride. So I ask, is Brom actually the headless horseman potentially in this story because remember in Ichabod's Diedrich Knickerbocker's (laughs) representation of him (laughs) however those papers got there right we know Ichabod probably didn't write them it's either him or the headless horseman if Brom were the headless horseman and he writes the story about how he threw his head that could potentially be a lie he could actually have thrown a pumpkin at Ichabod as per the Disney cartoon, knocking Ichabod off and then, you know, discarding with the body, hiding the body elsewhere, but leaving the hat and the pumpkin for this tale that he will write and Diedrich Knickerbocker one day finds. And that could potentially be why, if he didn't actually have some involvement in the story, why else would he shudder every time he hears the story? Because he was telling the story just fine at the party, but all of a sudden when he did the murder on Ichabod, could he be having remorse? And that's why he shudders when he hears the story in this pumpkin. I think that the the whole story, it it sets up all the supernatural stuff as kind of a red herring where while it's a, a ghost story, a horror story, 
you never really, really see it and have any truth to it. How do you know that that's what Ichabod saw? Nobody was there writing no, 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 it down. No, no, no. This is all what he wrote. This is Brom's story. What really happened is after the party, Brom chased him down and killed him. Uh, he didn't have to dress up like the, the headless horseman. He had his projectile ready down this narrow bridge to knock him down. This all could have been a setup to knock out the opponent vying for the love of Katrina Von Tassel. That's a pretty elaborate story to get away with murder. I'm just saying, consider it. <laughs> just consider it. It's a fun story. Oh, no. Story. <laughs> no, I definitely consider it. All right. So let me, we, okay, we can't, I feel like it's not fair to judge this from our ethnocentric view of these are the modern ways of doing things. It, it's very easy to judge, you know, the way things used to be done, right? But we can't just ignore it completely. I, I want to bring up this line because it's actually kind of interesting to me. When I, I kind of laughed when I read this, in the sense of just like I can't believe. This I know is where the you're story. going. I know exactly what line you're going to say. It's ridiculous. So the, the Guinea fowls, like <laughs> ill-tempered housewives. <laughs> so he's <laughs> the, the state of of women acting inappropriate is where he goes. Right. Okay. Thanks, Irving. Right. But then he goes on to describe. The gallant cock, that pattern of a husband, a warrior, and a fine gentleman, sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet and then generously calling out his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered. (laughs) Yeah, that one would not fly over too well in 2020. Yeah, so we'll just leave that one there. <laughs> it's, it's well, there. I love the other quote. If in his path he had not been crossed by being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together, and that was a woman. A woman. Oh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> like that Irving, one would work. You said a mouthful there, right? <laughs> yeah, that one would earn him a straight shot to the crotch, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, he's he's very clearly painting that. You know, the man comes home with the hunt and the food and the woman should just fall over themselves and be grateful for for everything that he's done while they've been at home. Like, <laughs> Well, I think this is reiterating exactly what Europeans kind of thought of American people were just this uncultured swine that's all huff and gruff and buff and everything right yeah well i mean he's been living in europe for many many years when he wrote this so you can't ignore the fact that european culture and influence probably caused him to maybe second guess or look at your american culture a little bit differently and the story using these towns and his upbringing that he actually saw in america provide the the perfect opportunity to mock it almost but at the same time i wonder is he really mocking it or because i kind of believed him when he said this that he actually believed these things yeah he probably did he may be trying to act a little bit showy off for the europeans and say you know like i'm the american woo you know and (laughs) and maybe he's going with that idea of being mean is the way to draw in women and so he writes or you know depicts them in this fashion in order to try to make them see him differently agreed well guys if you enjoyed today's conversation leave a pumpkin emoji down below to help us out we're going to move into our very subjective ratings of what we thought of the story crypto what are you going to give the story i'm struggling with this one the yeah. reason is is that my expectations are so different because this is the first time i'd read this story the source material And I think this is one of the rare cases where the source material, while pretty rich in some regards, has so little of the sci-fi horror element, but that has been extrapolated so heavily in the Disney cartoons, the movies, the TV show that was on a few years ago. And they're able to take this and make some pretty amazing, deep, rich characters. I mean, they take Ichabod and they almost turn him into the hero. Uh, and, and he's very likable. And I think those stories are so much better than the source material. And it's one of those rare, rare cases where I think the movies and shows are better than the story. And that doesn't happen that often. And maybe it's just because it's such an old story. Uh, but for enjoyment, I'm going to give this like a three. But I analytically, I think it's really cool to see how Irving did some of these kind of nuances with with women and with the idea of Europeans and Americans and the murder and the twist and how meta this story is, I'd give it like an 8.5. So I don't know what that average is out to, but yeah, this one uh, kind of fell short to what the 
the shows and books and other versions have done. I think actually for mine, I'm just going to go with one rating, averaging the two out to probably like a 6.5 as well. I accept that once an original source material has imprinted upon me, the Disney movie, it's hard for me not to see Ichabod that way or think that that's the original source material. So coming back and reading this 20, 30, 40 years after I watched the Disney cartoon, it's not totally fair because it's not like a first touch the way that was. And uh, at least some, I mean, obviously Ichabod's the the greedy, ever wanting more American, even in the Disney cartoon, but at least I don't have these lines about the ever hungry family of wives and children oh, that one hurt <laughs> so yeah. i'll just av- i'll just average this out to i think 6.5 is my overall rating for this one yeah i guess just that idea of what you get first in your head that i to me ichabod was kind of like a goof and in this story he's not a good person he's a womanizer and you can yeah. see how him coming in as the big city boy to a small town he's gonna get some slack for that He's not the hero that I that I remember, honestly, as I went back through the story. And then even when I watched the Disney cartoon, I'm like, oh, yeah, did, Ichabod's not the hero that I, I remember. So. Well, watch that, like, NBC TV show, man, and they make him about to be this, like, American Revolution war hero that was serving with George Washington. Well, and then they go into, like, the, the four horsemen. He's like one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I just... That, yeah. the movie, I just, I like to pretend those don't exist. Like, it's either the <laughs> Disney cartoon and maybe the story. And, and that's all Maybe this pre- story. <laughs> and that's Sorry, Washington Irving, pretend. we're throwing your story out. Disney yeah. wins. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just hard. It just, it doesn't age as well. You know what I mean? Like, with, with today's age of, of importance and, and values. And, you know, I try to look past it, but you know, there's only so much I can do. I'm, I'm a human being, right? So yeah. Do you think that if there was more sci-fi horror-esque to it, it would have saved it for you? I almost wish it was more campy and fun. Yeah, like the okay. opposite. You know what I mean? Like okay, like like the good old American story told from an American that left America and has now lived in Europe for many many years. <laughs> it's kind of funny All how right. this became an. It's kind of funny how this became an American story, but it was written by a dude that lived in Europe for many many years. <laughs> All right, guys, if you enjoyed today's conversation, please consider hitting the subscribe button to join us on the literature discussions. We post videos two to three times a week with a bonus video on Tuesdays. Una out. Peace.